Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Mark Erkin, and I want to welcome you to our Friday morning um, conference on thyroid nodule and thyroid cancer care here. We have a really provocative paper and an excellent group of both presenters and panelists who are going to um, really make for what I believe to be a very lively discussion this morning. We have the pleasure of having uh, Dr. Carissa um, LeClaire, who is a first-year otolaryngology resident at the University of Michigan. Um, she attended medical school at Dartmouth Geisel um, School of Medicine, where she collaborated with Dr. Louise Davies, who is this morning's discussant. Dr. Davies is an associate professor at Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth, and she is widely recognized for her work in cancer epidemiology, and in particular in thyroid cancer. Through her work, she has brought to light the problems associated with overdiagnosis and the inherent risks of overtreatment of subclinical thyroid cancers. In 2017 and 2018, um, she took a year away from her full-time clinical practice at the Veterans Affairs Medical Center at, at White River Junction in Vermont, where she serves as Chief of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery. And during that year, she tracked um, um, she traveled to Japan and England as a Fulbright Global Scholar, um, and uh, some of her work will be um, highlighted here this morning. We are also joined this morning by um, additional panelists who will be posing questions to uh, Drs. Uh, LeClaire and Davies. Dr. Mar Margaret Bramwine is an esteemed head and neck and thyroid pathologist at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York. Um, Dr. Mac Carroll is an endocrinologist in Hollywood, Florida, and former president of the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. And finally, Dr. Camilo Gonzalez is an endocrinologist in Monterey, Mexico, where he is a member of the faculty at the Universidad Autónoma uh, de Nueva uh, León. Um, and so with that, I am going to turn this over uh, to um, our initial presenter, who will present our um, the a paper for this morning and um, any questions that you may have please take this opportunity to pose those um, through our uh, chat session and that will give us um, an opportunity at the end and we will do our best to get to all of those questions and so uh, let's go ahead and get started uh, Carissa so thank you so much Dr. Erkin for that introduction hopefully you can all hear me okay here so my name, like you said, is Carissa LeClaire. I'm currently a first year otolaryngology resident at the University of Michigan. So I'm calling in from Ann Arbor today. And I do apologize, we tried this ahead of time and weren't able to figure out how to get my video working on the platform, but hopefully you can see my slides and hear me all right. I'm currently in between clinical duties giving this talk today. So I admit that this did give me a free pass to not have to change out of my scrubs for the talk. And so, I'm really honored and excited to be presenting this work on behalf of our study team, which included myself and Dr. Davies, who's with us today. We started this work together during my time at Dartmouth for medical school. And we also were very fortunate to have several wonderful collaborators from across the globe. So Drs. Katie Bell and Luis Ferrua Kanamori are both in Australia. Dr. Suhal Doi is in Qatar. And Dr. David Francis is at the University of Wisconsin. And I'd like to talk today about our work on gender inequity in diagnosis of thyroid cancer. So I'll begin by giving an overview of our study results. And afterwards, I'll open it up to Dr. Davies and the other panelists for any comments or to the audience for any questions about our work. So I'd like to start off first by giving some background on the topic of thyroid cancer incidence to put this all in context. Back in 2006, Dr. Davies was amongst the first to widely describe a phenomenon of increasing incidence of thyroid cancer in the United States. A trend that they found was being largely driven by an increase in diagnosis of small papillary thyroid cancers. So those that are more likely to be early stage and subclinical cancers. This graph here depicts rates of thyroid cancer incidence over time from 1973, which you can see on the left, to 2002 on the right. So the x-axis is showing time and the y-axis is showing increase in incidence and mortality rates. 
as you can see, there was a drastic increase in the incidence of thyroid cancer, which is that line that's precipitously increasing there, which did not correspond to any increase in thyroid cancer specific mortality rates. That's the line along the bottom, which notably has remained relatively stable over that time frame. The paper was amongst the first to conclude that we may be overdiagnosing many of these small subclinical thyroid cancers. The phenomenon of overdiagnosis is something that's previously been described in other diseases. So for example, prostate cancer. And I wanna emphasize that there really are two main requisites for this phenomenon to occur. Firstly, overdiagnosis requires a large reservoir of subclinical disease. And that's something that we'll discuss on my next slide because I think it's best described based on autopsy studies. And secondly, it requires increased surveillance. With respect to thyroid cancer, this has been accomplished through widespread expansion of ultrasound as well as fine needle aspiration for workup of thyroid nodules. Both of these modalities have demonstrated a drastic increase in use over the past several decades. So in comparison to that incidence data, I'd also like to introduce a study that described this subclinical reservoir of thyroid cancer that I was alluding to on the previous slide. This is a meta-analysis from 2016 that compiled 35 international studies for a total of nearly 13,000 patients to describe the prevalence of latent thyroid cancer identified on autopsy. So that to say cancer that's found in people who had no known thyroid disease prior to death. There was a wide range of prevalence described, and in some studies, thyroid cancer was found on up to 35% of autopsies on asymptomatic patients. And most notably, the study showed that there was no change in the prevalence of thyroid cancer over time, and this was between 1949 and 2007. So keep in mind the previous slide, this directly contrasts the enormous increase in incidence observed over this exact same time period. So if we've shown that the underlying reservoir of thyroid cancer prevalence hasn't changed over time, but the incidence rate or the rate of diagnosis has increased, it certainly brings into question our methods and patterns by which we're diagnosing thyroid cancer. So within this meta-analysis, really the only significant variable that they found to be correlated with prevalence of thyroid cancer was the intensiveness of pathologic examination, whether they were sectioning the whole thyroid gland versus just partial thyroid gland. And piecing all of this evidence together, they reached a similar conclusion that for thyroid cancer, the more that you go looking for it, the more that ultimately you will end up finding. So the initial study from 2006 sparked further interest into this trend, and there's been several other recent studies that have investigated reasons for this increasing incidence. As a collective whole, this body of work ultimately contributed to influencing the American Thyroid Association, who revised their guidelines for workup of thyroid nodules. So in 2015, their recommendation shifted gears to narrow workup for thyroid nodules and really focus on those that were more likely to harbor cancers within them. In 2014, Dr. Davies published a follow-up that described a gender disparity that they had observed in thyroid cancer diagnosis. Between the years of 1975 and 2009, the absolute increase in incidence of thyroid cancer was almost four times greater in women than that seen in men. And this finding really served as the springboard for our current study which looked to further describe and investigate this gender disparity in diagnosis of thyroid cancer. In the early stages of our work, we recognized that the incidence data is really strongest when complemented by autopsy prevalence data, like the studies that I described in, in the previous slides. And so given that realization, we actually reached out to the authors of that meta-analysis, and they were gracious enough to collaborate with us on this current study, and they really led the autopsy meta-analysis portion of our work. So as I just alluded to, our study consisted of two major parts, and I'd like to describe the methods of each of those here. Part one of the study utilized National Cancer Registry data from the SEER database, and stands for Surveillance, Epidemiology, and End Results. This database is curated by the National Cancer Institute and is derived from population-based registries. For those that might not be as familiar, what that means is just that the SEER population includes approximately one third of the US population. And this was sampled in a fashion that's representative of the entire US population. 
So this data then gets extrapolated to allow metrics on approximate incidence rates on a national level. This is widely considered to be the best available population level data for cancer. And it's the same methodology utilized in the other prior incident studies that I had just mentioned. So we used what's called the CR9 cohort because this collection dates back to 1973. And from this, we pulled data on patient demographics, tumor site, size and stage of the cancer, treatments that patients underwent, as well as their survival data. And using this database, we performed a cohort study of all patients with thyroid cancer dating from 1975 all the way up to 2017. Within this patient cohort, the primary outcomes that we were looking at were thyroid cancer incidence and mortality rates for each year between 1975 and 2017. These outcomes were calculated for each histological thyroid cancer type because as you know, different types can behave differently. So for this analysis, we grouped them into papillary, follicular was grouped with Herthel cell, and additionally, there was anaplastic and medullary cancers. Uh, additionally, we performed sub-analysis based on the size and stage of cancer, and we age-adjusted these rates based on the 2000 US population. So age adjustment just allowed us to account for population growth as well as an aging demographic over time so that we can make measurable comparisons in rates across decades. These analyses were performed with the goal to describe and compare trends by gender within each of these thyroid cancer subsets. For the second portion of the study, utilizing autopsy data, we performed a systematic review of autopsy studies current through May of 2021. In order to meet inclusion criteria, studies had to report autopsy prevalence of thyroid cancer. They had to utilize whole gland examination. Like we mentioned earlier, that meta-analysis had found that the type of gland examination was correlated with prevalence rates. So this was something that we wanted to control for over time by just including whole gland studies. Uh, studies were also required to report prevalence of papillary histology, and lastly, were required to break down this prevalence by gender. And by including just these studies, this allowed us to describe the prevalence of papillary thyroid cancer in women versus men that was identified on autopsy using whole gland pathologic examination. So I'd like to start off with the results of this meta-analysis because I think these really are our most novel finding here. So following a PRISMA systematic review, we identified a total of 12 study populations across eight studies, and this encompassed 2,303 patients. This is a pretty busy table that describes the prevalence of thyroid cancer, both within and across each of the autopsy studies. On the top half here is the prevalence in men for each study, and then a pooled prevalence that is seen within this blue box here. And then on the bottom, there is uh, the prevalence in women with each study, as well as the pooled prevalence in the box down here. And I do apologize for gender stereotyping these colors here. I just wanted to make it easy for everyone to be able to follow. And we found that there was no difference in the reservoir of latent papillary thyroid cancer between men and women. The pool prevalence in women was 14% and had a confidence interval of 8 to 20%. While for men, it was 11% with a confidence interval of 5 to 18%. And the overall p-value was 0.49. So the underlying prevalence we found was actually equal in women and men. As you may have suspected, this directly contrasted with what we found on incidence and mortality data. So these showed that women have exhibited a much larger rise in thyroid cancer incidence between 1975 and 2017. This graph illustrates time on the x-axis and incidence per 100,000 on the y-axis. For women over this time period, cases of papillary thyroid cancer increased by 13.3 cases per 100,000, and that corresponds to 389% increase. You can see the steep increase on the graph here. The blue lot, dotted line along the top is incidence of all thyroid cancers in women. And as you can see, it's being driven by the orange dotted line below it, which is the incidence of papillary thyroid cancer in women. In comparison, in men, cases also increased by approximately 300%, but the absolute increase was only 4.3 cases per 100,000. These are the solid blue and orange lines that you can see in the middle. And as you can see, both genders were affected by this increasing incidence over time. But in particular, 
it's the absolute increase in women that has been most disproportionate. So in stark contrast to the incidence rates, mortality rates have both been stable over time and equal between genders during the same time frame. This is represented by the bright blue line along the bottom, which is overlapping for men and women throughout this time period. Most of the results that I've described so far have been referencing papillary thyroid cancer. As you know, it's approximately 90% of thyroid cancer cases and heavily drives the overall incidence, like we're seeing in the graph here. But I do want to switch gears right now just to describe some interesting trends that we observed across other thyroid cancer histologies. So notably, the diagnosis ratio between men and women stratified depending on the lethality of thyroid cancer subtype. So I want to take you through this graph here. On the x-axis is time, and the y-axis is female to male incidence ratio. So as you increase along the y-axis, it's an increasing ratio of incidence for women to men, which corresponds to disproportionate rates of diagnosis in women. The pink arrow is pointing to the line for a one-to-one -one ratio. So anything that you see above that is being diagnosed more frequently in women. You can see that for small papillary cancers, the line along the top, that this diagnosis ratio is greater than four to one in women as compared to men. And in contrast, for more aggressive subtypes like medullary and anaplastic cancers, this diagnosis ratio approaches approximately one-to-one. -one and at times was even more common in men. As you can imagine, these are the cancers that are more likely to present with symptoms rather than being diagnosed on asymptomatic screening. And in the intermediate here are cancers of more of a mid-level aggressive nature that include follicular cancers, Herthel cell, as well as larger papillary cancers. And these are being diagnosed at approximately a two to one ratio. So this table we just used to summarize female to male ratios for incidence, mortality, and autopsy prevalence. And really the sticking point here is that women are disproportionately diagnosed with small localized papillary cancers. This is at a 4.3 to one ratio compared to men. And this contrasts the gender ratios for mortality, which is 0 0.96 to one for women versus men, as well as autopsy prevalence, which has a 1.07 to one ratio for women versus men. So to summarize here, we found that women are being disproportionately diagnosed with thyroid cancers, and in particular are burdened by diagnosis of small localized papillary cancers. However, we found that autopsy prevalence and mortality from thyroid cancer are equal across genders. With increasing lethality of thyroid cancer subtype, so those that are more likely to present with clinical disease, the gender ratio for diagnosis moved closer to approaching a one-to-one -one ratio. This data suggests that women are more likely to be diagnosed with subclinical thyroid cancer. Meanwhile, men are at greater risk for later diagnosis following progression of symptoms. So I'd like to shift a bit into discussion mode and share with you some evidence as to why we hypothesize that this might be the case. So I separate the why into two different categories. Number one, being the frequency of healthcare utilization, and number two, being the character of healthcare interactions. So speaking with regard to frequency, there have been multiple prior studies that have demonstrated that women utilize healthcare more often than men. And this is a difference that persists even when you control across reproductive health visits. As you know, Women have many of these that are built in throughout their life, but this is something that persists even when controlling for those. This greater interface with the healthcare field has potential to generate more opportunities for surveillance as well as diagnosis. We've also historically been taught that women are more likely to have thyroid cancer. And this notion may have actually influenced the character of healthcare practice patterns. Women are more likely to be referred for thyroid ultrasound and workup and further, they're more likely to be referred by general practitioners, and this is often for vague causes, things like fatigue or menstrual disturbance. Women are also more likely to undergo thyroid ultrasound as their initial imaging study, and we hypothesize that these practice variations have contributed to greater detection of small localized papillary cancers in women. So returning to these boxes of our requisites for overdiagnosis, really shifting focus to the box on the right of increased surveillance. 
there have been questions raised as to whether hormonal factors play a difference in thyroid cancer development. As of right now, good data available is a 2010 review that concluded that based on what we know so far, there are not any established molecular factors that appear to consistently explain gender differences in thyroid cancer. Some studies have shown an increased risk associated with recent pregnancy, a history of infertility, abnormal menstrual cycles, and a history of breast cancer. However, on meta-analysis, none of these were consistently associated with thyroid cancer risk. This study, as well as others, have suggested that the higher risk seen in these populations may actually just be due to higher rates of healthcare interaction around these time points. So with respect to limitations of our study, there's no record of how thyroid cancer cases captured in the SEER database were actually detected. And this does limit our ability to make conclusive inferences about subclinical versus symptomatic detection. Secondly, autopsy studies were small and they may not be representative of all populations. However, meta-analysis is a pretty strong approach that we utilize to overcome this limitation. In particular, we believe that one of the biggest strengths of our study is the ability to compare these two complementary sets of data. So on one hand, the incidence data showing current trends in diagnosis, and in contrast, the autopsy studies describing the underlying reservoir over time. In conclusion, I just wanna summarize the main takeaways from our work. So disparate rates of thyroid cancer in women have been primarily driven by detection of small localized papillary cancers. This has come without any significant mortality benefit seen across genders. In contrast, autopsy prevalence data has demonstrated an equal disease reservoir across men and women over time. So going back to these boxes here, this reservoir on the left appears to be equal across genders. And this leads us to the conclusion that the gender disparity seen in thyroid cancer diagnosis may be primarily driven by variations in healthcare utilization, as well as our own practice patterns. So in just wrapping up, I wanna thank Dr. Davies, firstly, for bringing me onto this research and for teaching me most of the things that I know about epidemiology and population level cancer research. Thank you all for allowing us to join today. It's particularly an honor being this early in my career to be able to speak to such a distinguished group across multiple specialties. And if you're interested in our work, uh, please check out, we recently published our findings in JAMA Internal Medicine quite a few months back. And so we're pretty excited about that. And with this, I will turn it over to the other panelists as well as open up for any questions. Can you, can everybody hear me okay? <clears throat> Um, Dr. LeClaire, that was amazing. That was outstanding presentation. Thanks so much for taking all of us through that. You know, I, <clears throat> um, after many years of working in this area, I found this paper and doing the work for it was really um, sort of surprising for me. It uh, really, I feel like, gave us new information about uh, the hormone in importance question in uh, and whether that's likely to play a role in thyroid cancer development. It's, it, it seems to argue against it, which I'd be really interested to hear what other people think about that. It, it also has highlighted to me that every time we look at analyses, we have to remember now that and take into context that if we're finding a lot of small cancers in women, it's going to tend to skew our analyses. So, for example, there was a really nice paper that just came out from the group at Michigan, a SEER Medicare analysis looking at um, competing causes of mortality in people over age 65. It showed that the cancer, um, the likelihood of dying from the cancer was higher if you were male. But of course that also, you have to consider who was more likely to be diagnosed with small cancers, which, which sort of skews, it continues to skew how we might think of it. And so, for myself, I've really started to try to retrain myself to say to myself, let me think not so much about the gender in which this cancer was diagnosed, but the characteristics of the cancer itself and how it came to attention and does it look like it contains high risk features and not so much just, oh, it's a woman and so you know, I'm less worried about her than I am about the man. No, I actually, <clears throat> 
it, we we should be thinking equally. So um, I'm really interested in others' thoughts uh, too, and um, Chris and I are happy to take questions. Well, congratulations. Great. Um, well, thank you both, and I echo your uh, comments um, on um, a great presentation from Carissa here. Can I, um, I'm going to start off just with a few quick questions um, and, uh, and then open it up to our panelists. So one question really is um, whether, why you uh, didn't break out um, subclinical follicular cancers in this analysis, but rather group them all together here. So maybe if you could just um, either Louise or Carissa, if you could just comment on that for openers. So I, yeah, I will turn this over to Dr. Davis to answer most of it, but essentially we performed many, many analyses along the process of this. This was something that we did over several years, enough times that the SEER data updated on two different annual cycles and we had to redo it. And so Amongst our initial analyses, we actually had broken out by follicular cancer, but we found based on the trends that that it wasn't actually contributing much to the distinction amongst analysis and seemed to actually be confusing the data a little bit, which is why we grouped it. But I think Dr. Davies can probably explain this a bit better. Here. Yeah, and I'm not sure, you might be, so there, you might be getting at, I'm not sure, but there are some autopsy data about the prevalence of follicular cancer at autopsy. It, there's not quite as much data on that, but we do know that that exists at autopsy as well, which might help explain what we see here. Um, so, but we really focused on the autopsy studies that um, that that reported on papillary cancer um, specifically, and yeah, as you know, the numbers of purple cell cancers are really small. It wasn't until 2017 that we really started seeing that clear um, break and separating them out. And the numbers are so can be hard to really make good inferences. So even though it feels a little bit like oversimplifying, um, group them together as, as they are still sometimes even in some pathology departments probably. Um, when you're working at a high level like this, I think it can be, um, help keep the analysis. Does that answer your question? Yes, um, it, it certainly does. And so, uh, thank you. One of one of the questions I'd, I'd actually like to uh, um, to at the moment direct to Dr. Bramwine because one of the um, one of the features of your analysis of autopsy series had to do with the handling of the, what the reported handling of the thyroid gland is in autopsy. And so Margie, maybe if you could tell us what is the standard um, practice with respect to how the thyroid gland is intended to, is evaluated um, in a routine autopsy? Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so first of all, congratulations. Uh, Carissa, that was that was really a beautiful presentation that you did. So I really have to repeat repeat that that acknowledgement to you and a uh, and really beautiful study. So Louise and Carissa, congratulations. So routinely, um, one would bread loaf section throughout the whole thyroid. So the idea of only um, sectioning half a thyroid doesn't quite make sense to me. It may be that some patients had hemithyroidectomy, you know. But but I I understand your desire to um, really limit the studies to where all of these features were, were explicitly spelled out. Um, because when I first looked at, at the data, I thought, well, 2,000 doesn't, you know, 2,300 doesn't sound like that many autopsies. But, you know, very importantly, as you say, in the prior studies, um, you know, there, there's in the prior autopsy studies before 200, uh, 2015, there doesn't seem to be a shift in incidence of autopsies to this, to this era that you're looking at. Um, so, so to answer your question mark, bread loafing the entire thyroid is what's standard. Um, I actually have a question about the autopsy studies. Um, I see it was not bro bro broken down into size, and I would be interested to know what the size range was in, in autopsy studies and if there was any difference in the mean size between men and women. 
yeah, I, I actually, I can't remember now whether even that information is fully available in detail. Carissa, do you remember? Yes, I think so some I'm not gonna, not all. I have to try to field this one. I believe that there was only one of the autopsy studies that actually reported by size. I, I think that we agreed that that would have been something that would have been beneficial. Part of sure. the limitation was the fact that many of these autopsy studies were, were old. And so from the 1970s, the 1980s, with few that were more recent. But I, I do wonder if, as you mentioned, the gold standard at this point is whole gland sectioning of the thyroid as to whether it may have just been different practice at that time. Um, none of these patients that were included in the autopsy studies should have had a hemithyroid or a total thyroid because if they had had known thyroid disease, they would have been excluded. And so I, I do sort of wonder as to what their practice patterns were, but I, I just want to emphasize the fact that um, yeah. You know, these are all patients not known to have any disease. Well, right. uh, we, do, we do know from the methods that they did describe, and, you know, of course, people are so careful now about methods descriptions compared to, you know, this 50s, 60s, 70s, but they described, and so it's really interesting to me, Margie, that you describe how autopsies are done now, because some of the methods papers say specifically the thyroid gland was palpated for nodules, and then those were the areas that were examined. And so there are some autopsy studies where yeah, they took out the thyroid gland, they kind of felt it, and then they would slice in there and look, whereas others really did the bread loaf like you describe. And so, of course, then you get, I think, different results. You know, if you look in the places that maybe the nodule is sort of hidden under the surface because you bread loaf, mm -hmm. then you just find more. It's interesting. Louise, um, could you just clarify something that's always been a question for me, and that is why is the um, the data out of Finland such an outlier here in terms of the incidence? Is this a difference in the processing that you found on autopsy, or is there some inherent different that, uh, difference in respect to the population? You know, that's a really good question. I mean, that particular study by Herrick, so Herrick did, uh, I believe, it was a he, and he did a number, he worked with a number of different countries to look at autopsy rates in different places. And in that Finnish study, they took three millimeter slices. So they like went to the extreme. I think actually the goal of that study was like, how many can we find, right? <laughs> and so compared to other autopsy studies, if you take three millimeter slices of the entire gland, they found that that's what you got in sort of a Northern European population. If you did three millimeter slices of a different population, I don't know if you would find, uh, you know, the 35% rate. Maybe you would actually, we just, you know, we don't have those data, but I think it was the three millimeter slices for the most part. I don't know, Margie and, um, yeah. you know, what do you think about whether country or geography might affect it? Well, it's, it's hard to imagine that, um, that that geography doesn't uh, impact the you know um, the incidence rate. So there were two outliers. One was Finland, um, and then the other one was uh, Poland. It was an outlier in the other direction, you know. And so um, you know, uh, I suppose you 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 may be laying the grounds for suggesting a prospective autopsy study that is uh, you know uniformly spread loaves the whole gland in in a uh, in three millimeter sections. Yeah, I mean, that's what we really need, right? And then, because then we would also be able to say like, you know, is there some underlying prevalence issue that's, that's occurring? You know, people are very worried about um, PFAs and other hormone um, disruptors, right. this right. kind of thing. And, you know, we don't, we don't really know. <laughs> right, right, we don't know. I, I, we started working now with a researcher um, in, at Mount Sinai Hospital who um, is, will be publishing data to show that the incidence of, of thyroid cancer in Staten Island, New York, is elevated relative to the other boroughs. And her, um, her she's hypothesizing that the, uh, the Fresh Kills um, uh, uh, a garbage dump site, which has been there you know, for decades and decades, may influence the local uh, thyroid cancer rate. So there's a lot of, lot, lot of things we don't know. Yeah, yeah. I would. I totally agree with you. Um, first of all, uh, Carissa and Dr. Louise uh, Davies, incredible presentation. This is incredible food for thought. Um, 
being Mexican and representing the Latin American uh, society, I, I do think that that's a very interesting thing. And, and what Dr. Branwin is saying, I don't know. I don't. I can't. I can't see how it wouldn't impact the geography and, and exposure to uh, local factors would would impact thyroid cancer prevalence. We here in Mexico and in most of Latin America, we have the that gut feeling that biologically, can, thyroid cancer behaves a little bit more aggressive than the rest of the world. However, we don't have any data to support that. So we've always uh, thought that this type of study kind of answers that question and. Dr. Erica knows me well, and I'm an advocate for the disparity uh, 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 topic on, on thyroid cancer. And uh, I was just wondering, do you feel that this gender difference, and be, being mostly in the, the less than two centimeter papillary thyroid cancers, do you think it, it carries along on all, eight, on all of the spectrum in age? Do you think, um, uh, I don't know, a 20 year old or a 70 year old male, will, will, they, will they seek uh, medical uh, healthcare the same way? Do you think uh, I think I think a very interesting study would be to see episode two of this, this exact same study to see how this carries along after we we start incorporating and categorizing thyroid cancer in in the new histologies that Dr. Brandman can speak to us like with greater uh, uh, knowledge than I could. But what happens when we factor in NIFTP and when we factor in other other different uh, types of thyroid cancer? How, how does that change the data that we see right now? That's very interesting. Krista, any thoughts from you? Yeah, I, I guess I would, uh, I think you raise a lot of really interesting questions here. And some of the ones that you ask about whether this difference has persisted across different age groups is something that we also were curious about. SEER does have, to a limited sense, data available on age. And so one of the initial raw analyses that we had taken a look at was trying to compare these trends across genders uh, in different age spectrums. And the data, because it was pretty limited, I, I believe was a bit messy in the sense that it was difficult to interpret and didn't necessarily show, because we had hypothesized, you know, possibly there might be in greater periods of, say, as a woman, you're interacting with healthcare more often in reproductive health years for some people. And so we had wondered whether that would persist with a greater difference along those times. And I don't think that based on those initial results that we had seen anything that correlated with that. But I think that that was definitely something that we were curious about and wanted to pursue probably in a further study because I agree that it's, it's a very interesting question. Yeah, and I, I will tell you that actually we are looking now at the data by age group, um, both the autopsy data and then looking at that with SEER. Um, you know, one thing when you construct these epidemiologic studies is the data gets so complicated so fast that actually the real work is in in um, finding the data that where you have a clear explanation and you can really feel that you can make a strong argument about association. Um, and it actually gets very messy when you start to think about the interaction between age and gender and detection and how much might be change in immune surveillance and these kinds of things. And so we decided to just stick with gender <laughs> on this one, frankly, and then take age as sort of a separate question. Um, because it, it can get, you know, you have so many graphs and pictures and you're like, I don't even know what all this means, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. So, so all of this is, actually, we will be soon, there will be some data on what we saw by by age. And um, and I think age does matter, right? Like how much you're interacting with the healthcare system. There's probably also things about immune surveillance um, too, as we age, yeah. Uh, Louise, I have a question for you. Um, so, you know, as you know, there's a tremendous um, predisposition for women to have Hashimoto's thyroiditis over men. And, uh, and so what is your opinion about um, the, the increased likelihood of PTC in the face of Hashimoto's and this being a female predominant disease? You know, I have to say, I, like, I, like every time a new Hashimoto's paper comes out, like I read it and I'm still not sure what I think about that. I actually, I guess... I would look to somebody else to be an expert on that. I mean, Camilo and Margie, I mean, what do you guys think? Do you think that's a real association? Do you think it's do you think it's because these people get surveilled more? Like, I don't know what to think at this point. 
Mark, what do you think about this question? <laughs> I I um I will uh, defer to my esteemed colleague from Mexico to shed some light on this one. Um, I think it's a provocative <laughs> question, but I I'm not sure that I can uh, answer. I think your your the the question or I think the um uh, the issue of these folks who are presenting pretend, you know clinically um, as being highlighted uh, and targeted for ultrasound early probably is as good a answer as, as you can come up with uh, without a, um, a more definitive study. I can't, I got to ask Louise this, um, I can't help but think that there are um, investigators who either currently or previously were trying to unroof the, dip, the gender differences and looking at hormonal influences um, between men and women that were now based on the the light that you've shed on this topic are now scratching their heads. Why am I wasting all my time here and looking for, um, you know, for inherent differences between men and women um, when in reality that's not, this may not be an underlying biologic difference here. Um, so do you? I, I mean, I, I have to agree with you. I mean, it, I, I think it, and I, I mean, I didn't really think of it that way, but I presented the data to a different a different group of people recently and it was actually one of the other people on the call who said wow like this he's like this really sort of makes you think that hormones are really not that significant now um i, I think margie brought up the point that we don't know if there might be a difference in size or growth trajectory so you know i don't think it takes hormones totally off the table but it certainly um it certainly takes it down a notch, doesn't it? <laughs> right. Um, it, yeah. it muddies the ideological waters. Yeah, it really does. Yeah. How? Why? I mean, so, part of this is congratulations on doing this study, and really is a landmark study. And I have a feeling you have uh, completely altered um, the curriculum for medical <laughs> schools and teaching. Um, you know, the underlying. Uh, um, demographics of thyroid uh, cancer here. Um, so they're probably going to send you a bill to um, uh, to alter <laughs> the textbooks on this. But why do you think it took so long to, with so many people interested in this, um, to really come up with this conclusion? What what was everybody else missing? Um, in, uh, or is this just hats off to you? Yeah, hats off well, to you. I mean, I have to say, right, so we, when I published this paper, so when Gil and I wrote about this in 2014, like we we actually said the same thing almost exactly that we said in this paper, but it just didn't really seem to resonate. And like that was a long time ago, right? I have to say, like I've been thinking about this, and poor Carissa, like you might have heard like an iota in her voice of like the pain <laughs> that we went through to like figure out like how like what is going on? How can we explain what we think we're seeing here? You know, like these papers come out and like they sort of look simple, but the the work and the thought that goes into like, how are we gonna actually figure this out? That takes years, right? So from like 2014 to like 18, I, we were, I was sort of marinating on this. And mm -hmm. then when the meta-analysis paper came out and Chris and I started working on this, there was a point at which we sort of looked at each other and were like, I think we have to reach out to the Australians, right? <laughs> because, um, and it was my research group too that actually suggested it. I have to say too that my research group, um, which is a multidisciplinary group of internal medicine docs and other surgeons and other specialists who really said, I think the message here is that you, is that you need to help people realize that we've been thinking about it wrong. And they also were the ones to suggest this idea of thinking about ratios. So I guess this is all to say that doing epidemiologic research like this, it, it takes a lot of like just time and thought and then presenting your findings to people and getting input from others. So I, I don't know if that helps, but it's- Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 You know, something that came to me as you, as you were speaking, you know, um, so that, you know, it's uh, the uh -huh. era of, um, population-based autopsy finding publications has long passed, right? So, you know, when, when I 
before I read your paper, when I think about, you know, autopsy based studies, you know, I think about the Germans, I think about the, um, the Japanese, I think about these meticulous papers that were published in the early 20th century, because, you know, the description of anatomic findings, pathologic findings, that was sort of the, that was what pathologists did at that time. Whereas now, you know, it would be very hard to find a, you know, a pathologist to be, I, I, I am projecting now, you know, it's very hard to find a pathologist who would be very interested in meticulous autopsy studies because the forefront of pathology research is someplace is over there, you know? So, um, so it's, so it's, it's interesting, you know, I mean, it, you, I, I um, totally get why you sort of, it, because it's the autopsy ratios that are the underpinnings of your conclusions. Yeah, it really is. I mean, without the autopsy data, you haven't got a leg to stand on, right? right? And that, that was essentially what we finally came to the realization of, you know, we looked at data every which way and different years and segments and trends and yeah. So one of the reasons for the disconnect may be because it's two different eras, you know, it's the, it's the, it's the, even though it may not be reported, even though the reports may be suboptimal, you know, the, the focus on these kind of autopsy based population studies is in, in yesterday's era. And the focus of what is, uh, you know, ultrasounds doing to the incidence of, of diagnosis of, of cancers is in, is in this era. So, so Margie, if, um, just one quick question here. Um, and before I do, I just want to highlight um, the uh, my headache that I had while I was reading this paper and figuring out why I wasn't smart enough to take on this study and hearing Louise articulate uh, the pain made it um, uh, made it clear to me that my headache was justified. And um, uh, and, and so, uh, again, hats off to you, because this really is a landmark um, contribution and, and you should be congratulated for it. But Margie, when you're saying that the standard of care now is bread loafing of thyroid, what thickness of sections, is there a standard for that? Um, sure. That's a good question. So Louise had mentioned three millimeters. I think that when when we cut anything, it's usually probably about five millimeters. Although you don't take a you don't take a um, a ruler to your cuts, but you know, like I would say that um, you know somewhere between three and five. But and if I had to like you know bet the farm on my own bread loafing, it's usually about five millimeters or so. Except when I'm doing margins, in which case it's about two millimeters. And so. From an institutional perspective, if one were to go into a database on autopsy findings, um, would that be a reliable way for one to get real-time data related to the to the diagnosis, um, or does it take a skilled pathologist um, I, um, who's, who understands path, um, thyroid pathology that may, in order to reliably detect um, you know, in a routine autopsy, whether there's subclinical thyroid cancer? I think that's a great question. Um, I, I think one would, one would need to look at the N, right? If you're in a place where, uh, where there's a very big autopsy um, practice and, you know, it's a very robust with many pathologists working there, um, you know, I think that that you could, now I, I'm not throwing shade on small practices, but I'm just saying that in a in a robust practice, you could probably you could well trust that you know, be, especially when you're training people, you're training residents. You know, you you want to train them to look hard. So, so you know, I I suspect if you wanted to go to the Sinai, you know, data. I mean, look, you know, the olden days things were written on these you know index cards, but it would be a good place to start because it's been a training program since forever. It's so funny, you know, I just assumed that these studies had been prospect done prospectively, but actually, as you're saying that, Mark, I bet you're right. These may have just been their autopsy records, like they didn't really say whether they were prospective. It may have just been, and, and the Herrick study in Finland, they may mm -hmm. have said, you know what, for a couple of years, we're going to like look super close at all the thyroids, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, and, and that's why they got different results. Mm -hmm. from the other ones that were maybe a retrospective review of autopsy, just files. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, let me just uh, uh, call upon uh, Dr. Mac Harrell, um, who is one of our panelists, and we I've been remiss here. Mac, do you have any thoughts or comments on um, this morning's discussion? Well, Mark, as you know, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, as you know, I work in a uh, an endocrine surgery practice down here in South Florida, where we perform about uh, 700 endocrine surgeries a year. And when we look at our thyroid cancer data, 70% of it has coexisting chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis associated. And uh, I think the center of this issue is the issue of chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis. Are we, uh, is this a discovery bias or is this a real association? And that's what we really need to address. Um, I also have a comment. First of all, this was an excellent presentation and the article is very important so thank you so much uh, to Dr. Davis and Dr. LeClaire for that but my my fly in the ointment is I question the use of the buzz phrase gender inequity when I think what you've described is a gender difference and a very important gender difference uh, remember that the Merriam-Webster definition of in inequity is injustice or unfairness and uh, I know you've attempted to look at that, but I don't think you've proven that there's necessarily injustice or unfairness in the system. <laughs> there, there may be, but yeah. as scientists, educators, I would just caution you that we have to be careful about the uses of buzz phrases in medical scientific reporting as they may promote unnecessary enmity and division in a profession that purports to heal. So that's my uh, only... I, it's yeah. a small comment. I, I apologize for parsing the words in such an excellent piece of work, but um, uh, yeah, I well, thought I, somebody you know, say it, and I did. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, there is an equity, right? Like the men, the men are kind of missing out, actually. Like there, there are men who are at risk of being diagnosed later, and there are women who um, who are exposed to side effects of treatments um, that their male counterparts weren't exposed to. So um, I hear what you're saying. And, um, you know, there are certain words that, that have become trigger words. And I have to say, actually, overdiagnosis is one of those words. I don't use that word anymore. Um, and maybe we'll have to move away from the inequity word. But there is inequity, right? Men, men are at risk of having their cancer found later and then needing more extensive treatment. And women are at risk of having a subclinical cancer found and then maybe needing to take thyroid hormone that if they'd been a man, that tumor might never have been found, right? So it, it cuts both ways. <laughs> it's not yeah. just about. I, I, totally, I totally get your point. But once again, when we use the term inequity today, we're usually referring to some sort of institutional or in, inadvertent injustice. And I guess the worst case scenario, the, the case that I make is this. And yeah. this might be inadvertent injustice. Margie? Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I also thought about your use of the term inequity. It, it, it bothered me for a bit. And then I, I came to your, you know, point before this discussion of, well, if you are ex overexposing women to, um, uh, to, con to consequences that are unnecessary, well, then you could, you could frame it as an inequity. I think that personally, I'd probably use a different term, less less triggering. Um, on the other hand, I do want to make the the comment that um, overdiagnosing over overdiagnosing women does not, in fact, deplete the opportunity to diagnose men. You know, it's not that it's a limited cup and you're just dipping into that cup and that's it. You know, there's you are only going to diagnose a hundred PTCs and so. Sorry, guys, you know. Um, so it, it, again, it cuts both ways and it's not so simple. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a really good point that it's not a zero sum game. Yeah, I would, I would, we could do better. Go ahead, Mac. Women. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would have to argue that in my own practice, um, the number of women who report detection of their thyroid nodules who come to work up. Um, by um, OBGYN specialists is remarkably high. 
And that really, you know, it's a, um, this is anecdotal reporting, but I am sure that it's real. Um, there is no correlate in, in the male um, healthcare provider um, a, a category who routinely examines um, the thyroid gland. And so yeah. this is probably, you'd have to get back to um, education and, and training um, in order to uh, try to level the playing field here for early detection. Right, right. Yeah, especially in, in this era where doing a physical exam has become a superpower. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Let me and, just, yeah. Dr. Harrell, can you just come back? Do you have thoughts here? You have highlighted mm -hmm. this, um, the presence of thyroiditis. Do you have thoughts here on an underlying pathophysiology? Uh, with respect to Hashimoto's and the incidence of thyroid cancer? Well, there are a lot of people that are smarter than me who've looked at the uh, subpopulations of lymphocytes in these glands and found these sort of permissive uh, lymphocyte populations around papillary cancer. So, so I think there is some uh, interaction that possibly tricks the immune system, which is already activated in 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 chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis into and that would be PDL. That would be that would be PDL. I mean that's the whole thing is that that PDL actually will will trick local immune response. Yes. Oh, so on. I think there's something to it. Uh, and just why it would make so many little small cancers occur and many of those are the surgeries we ended up having to do, but there are also some very bad ones that uh, that coexist with the Hashimoto's as well. So it's it's something we really need to look into because I think it may be the cause, uh, um, what, the leading cause for this disparity because most of the people we're getting have been ultrasounded uh, incorrectly because they have a thyroid hormone requirement or they have uh, a Hashimoto's feel to their gland on exam. And uh, so I do think there is a discovery bias here. Yeah, and I think um, I'll stir the pot for you, Matt, here. That's what we call a, a structural bias, right? We People feel like, oh, I should be ultrasounding a gland when in fact, as you indicated, it's not indicated, right? Yeah. And so it's this practice that we've all been raised with or that people sort of feel like maybe they should be doing. And it's, you know, it's just baked in. And so, um, as Mark said, we have to like, think about how we teach our medical students. <laughs> I think you're absolutely right, Louise. I think I that I, the, sorry, the, I interrupt the here. I just, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, I, I don't mean to interrupt here at all. I just wanted to add in one interesting point because I think you all raise a lot of a lot of you know questions about will we teach this differently to medical students? And it's been interesting for myself recently, a medical student, that while I was in school, we actually were taught the 2015 guidelines from the American Thyroid Association. And so that has certainly been much more familiar to myself and, and I think my generation at least. So it'll be interesting to see how that influences practice patterns in the generation in which this has been something that we've known throughout our practice rather than something that's changed during, during the clinical practice. So I just wanted to add that. It's interesting as a junior member of the room. Right. I was gonna say any, that. Any final comments before we? Yeah, I think Camille. Ahead, Camilla. Yeah, I was going to say about the Hashimoto's question. Uh, it's really interesting. Um, like Dr. Lu Dr. Davies was saying, um, the the question when when it comes to epidemiological studies, it gets really tricky to uh, identify what factors are the ones that are driving uh, a disease. And Hashimoto's has been identified or pinpointed as one of those that make it more more uh, more fact more more um, probable to to have uh, thyroid cancer. And recently, and I don't want to go off topic uh, a whole bunch, I particip I'm participating in a study evaluating people that had um, subclinical uh, COVID disease, COVID-19 infection, and we prospectively studied how they, if they had any thyroid um, uh, disturbances in the thyroid hormone production. So um, in that regard, uh, we found out that most of the people that did have changes in their hormone levels after th um, uh, being uh, exposed to co COVID were people with antib high antibody titers, so meaning Hashimoto's disease. And although we we did a cluster uh, randomization to to try to not have it unbalanced between male and female, 
the, the outcome turned out to be mostly female had uh, uh, some subjects had had uh, this disease. So it comes Hashimoto's is has been identified to have a gender difference, but now we're we're now realizing that thyroid cancer might not have it. At least that's a clinical uh, thyroid, papillary thyroid cancer, or well differentiated thyroid cancer. So it there's also a, an inequity or a disparity in, in what we see in the underlying Hashimoto's and what we were, we're realizing now through this study. So it's a very interesting study. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to how to answer that question, but it's definitely something that we should look into. Is is Hashimoto's actually a gender difference? Is there a, actually a, a big of a gender difference in Hashimoto as we thought there was? That's a good question, Mike. Right. Yeah. So, folks, we're up against the nine o'clock hour. I want to again thank um, Carissa and um, incredibly provocative um, and really ground uh, groundbreaking. Um, and uh, so thank you for enlightening us um, on so many different things related to the incidence of thyroid cancer. I can't help but leave the, um, this morning by highlighting um, the backgrounds between um, behind Dr. Davies and Dr. Uh, Camilo Gonzalez Velasquez. If you notice, on the wall behind Dr. Camilo Gon uh, Dr. Gonzalez um, Velasquez, there are histologic sections from the thyroid gland, which is quite different than the background for Dr. Davies and Dr. Brandwine. So the true thyroid specialist uh -huh. here is thyroid really lover. reflected in the artwork <laughs> behind. So with that, I want to thank everybody for um, joining us this morning and hope that you'll join us again next week. Uh, this has been just a, a terrific um, discussion. I'm sure it will um, uh, continue to um, uh, to lead to much more discussions in the thyroid community moving forward. So thank you very much, everybody. Stay safe, and um, uh, thank you again for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you.